Show of hands, how many people have seen the entire series? Pretty good. Okay, you have a potential audience to get to a lot more. Um, Hillary, I'm going to start with you. That there are, I think, about 2,000 hours of footage that was taken during your run for president. Um, why, did your why did your campaign have cameras with you, and did you ever have a plan for what that footage would be used for? No. Um, the answer, I think, is that campaigns in recent times have done, you know, behind the scenes looks. And I may be wrong about this, but I think. Uh, we used a little bit of it during the campaign for uh, some um, advertising or narrative pieces. So we were left with um, 1,700 hours of uh, campaign footage, and a number of uh, prior campaigns had used that footage for uh, kind of uh, retrospective uh, looks at the campaign. And that's what this originally started out as. And it was uh, intended to try to take advantage of uh, the footage that we did have. Uh, but then uh, once we got started uh, with Propagate and, and Hulu, and once Nanette came on board, you know, they saw a much bigger um, idea than that. Did you have any idea of what that footage would be used for after the election? I mean, it's sitting around for a little bit. Did you? want it out of sight, out of mind? Or did you think there was another story to be told? Oh, I don't know, John. I, um, <laughs> there was so much stuff to worry about and think about that uh, having uh, the footage uh, just sitting wherever it's at, I guess in my uh, campaign um, uh, files. Uh, so when people came to me with the idea, I thought, sure, you know, why not? Uh, it, might, it might be interesting. And it, would, it was also a way for people to perhaps see the incredible uh, team that we had in the campaign. Um, I think by the end, we had, I don't know, six to 7,000 people, uh, mostly out in the field, but certainly at the headquarters uh, in Brooklyn, you know, uh, several hundreds. So I thought it would be a, a way for, for them and for any interested viewer to um, get an inside look about how you put together a presidential campaign and uh, the people who are actually uh, driving it. Nanette, you come into Hulu, they have all of this footage. What is your pitch to them, and I guess even to Hillary, about what you want to do with that footage? Yeah, I, I guess I ruined the plans to do a, a look at the volunteers, which, <laughs> but it was, it was part of it as well. Um, my pitch was to do something uh, bigger than the campaign. I, I felt like for a lot of people, including myself, the campaign still at that time felt very raw and wasn't sure we were ready to relitigate it. But, but more than that, I felt like um, there was, looking at the scope of Secretary Clinton's life and everything she has gone through, I felt there was an opportunity to tell a much bigger story about our culture, about our system of politics, about the women's movement, because she was the one who, as one of her advisors says in the film, is the tip of the spear. She's always pushing the boundaries of that, and you really see the backlash. And I thought, you know, okay, some people think maybe they're familiar with some of this story, but to do it with such access in an intimate way and really kind of unpack this mythology surrounding her, which is very complicated. You know, you have this incredibly polarizing historical figure um, who is, you know, both vilified and admired, and she, you know, she's a real person. Within all of that mythology, there exists a real human, as you can see, who's funny and uh, charming, and so, uh, yeah, so that was my idea, to be able to tell her life story and use that as a springboard to comment on important cultural issues. But to still inter... What I loved about the footage from 16 was not so much to relitigate it, although there's some of that, because you can't help it once you're in it, but what I loved and why I chose the sort of structure where you interweave it was because there was this unfiltered access to her and her staff from the beginning. So f you could see the real Hillary from the very first moment. And if you just save that and you go cr chronologically and you wait all the way till the fourth episode, it would be such a lost opportunity. So the idea was to structure it with this 
back and forth, not too often, because that's just confusing for a viewer. Um, and it's a hard structure to actually pull off, so uh, it was a challenge. Hillary, Nanette's pitch was to interview you and other people who worked on the campaign and are close to the campaign and close to you. What was, your, what was the story that you wanted to tell through those interviews that maybe the footage couldn't tell? You know, John, I have to um, kind of take my mind back to when um, Nanette basically proposed making this bigger than uh, the campaign and really focusing on my life, but using my life as a springboard into the women's movement, our political system, and these other themes uh, that run through uh, the uh, documentary. And I obviously knew I'd be interviewed. I was interviewed for 35 hours. Um, and I knew there were ob obviously a list of other people. But you know, she had free reign to interview anybody that would in interview with her. Um, and I think that uh, because she decided to interweave, you know, my life and certain uh, events as it unfolded, but in a, a way that I found uh, incredibly uh, well done. Uh, so you'll see people literally that I grew up with or that I went to high school or college or law school or that were colleagues. And then a lot of people that, you know, she chose to interview to fill in uh, the story. Uh, so I, I was um, on board uh, to doing it. And uh, there's a very poignant um, interview in, uh, in the documentary of my literally best friend from sixth grade, a, a woman named Betsy, who was dying when um, Nanette interviewed her. And, and you know, she, uh, when Nanette asked her if you wanted, she wanted to be part of uh, this um, project, she said yes, and you know she died um, last uh, July, so she never got to see the finished documentary. But it's incredibly moving to me that she agreed to be interviewed, and she was such a huge part of my life, literally for you know all but the first ten years when I met her. That it meant a lot to me that uh, Nanette asked her, and that she agreed. Were there certain people that were hard to get? to go on camera, and who would you put at the top of that list? And even within that list, who are the people that really presented you with the greatest challenge in terms of how you're gonna ask difficult questions? Well, the hardest people to get were all of the conservative voices. Um, we went out to 30, 40 people that overlapped with Secretary Clinton's life from the 90s onward, um, from Newt Gingrich to Lindsey Graham to even more moderate uh, uh, politicians like Susan Collins, Olympia Snow, um, and they just all said no. And uh, you know, and I would follow up too because I am not very good at taking no as an answer. <laughs> and uh, like for example, Newt Gingrich, who I was really, really wanted to include his voice, or whatever you know, however interesting that would have been. Um, because he was a big part of her time as first lady and being on the opposition and leading that charge. So uh, I, you know, we sent a letter formally and his sister does his PR and they, you know, very diplomatically said no. And then someone gave me a cell phone number and I called him. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't believe he picked up. I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> like, you're, I, you don't know who I am. You don't know this number. But, and then I just launched into my pitch, and he's like, oh yeah, no, I know, I know what your, uh, your offer was, and no, I have I absolutely, I, I, I think he said something like, there's nothing I'd less like to do than that. <laughs> and then I said, well, you know, it's really, it's a very fair balance, we have complete editorial control, we're trying to do something, this is why I want your voice in it, you know, I'm trying to show the other side. And he said, I would rather stick a needle in my eye. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of convincing to be done now. So that was challenging. I mean, we did get some, you know, we were criticized for sometimes for not having enough Republican voices. We did have Bill Frist. We have uh, David Brock, who was, you know, one of the lead writers for the main conservative uh, news magazine at the time, The American Spectator. Uh, David Gergen, who did work for President Clinton, but he is a Republican and he worked for, you know, President Reagan and President Bush. So there were also voices from the other side, but we, we did want to include more, especially the people that were very vociferously 
uh, vocalizing their feelings. And they just unanimously said, no way. I'd rather stick a needle in my eye. Or more politely in writing. Hillary, there are so many slights in this film. It's like bleeding to, get to death from a thousand paper cuts. The little things that are said in passing that seem in isolation terrible, but in accumulation horrific. Bleed, and that's the idea of how women law students were treated at Yale. The judge who asks you to twirl around while you're at the podium. There's a line that Chris Matthews has that I won't even dignify by repeating. A TV announcer calls you the ambitious yuppie from hell. All of those little things over the course of the documentary, to me, made a very lasting impact of what is casually said but is so hurtful. You're right, John. <laughs> and um, I think Nanette did a masterful job of weaving that in. Because again, it's not just about me, which is what I have you know, tried to uh, point out. Uh, there is this deep um, sexism, misogyny. You know, I wrote about it in the book that I wrote after the campaign in a, in a chapter about women in politics, but it's women in the media, women in business, women in the professions, whatever. And, you know, the, the relentless belittling and demeaning and dismissing um, is often either ignored or absorbed in a way that you don't fully appreciate the impact of as you move through your life. So, one of my concerns is, you know, you have to develop such tough skin uh, to be in the public arena. At least that's, that was certainly true for me in the time that I came of age and the experiences that I had. And uh, some of my friends from law school talk about this uh, because they had the same experiences. And you, you don't want to be um, battered uh, and... Uh, hurt, uh, broken by a constant belittlement, but you also don't want to be so impervious that you can't uh, absorb whatever legitimate criticism might be coming your way. So very early on, I kind of developed this mantra to uh, take criticism seriously, but not personally. Uh, that doesn't include, you know, the harassment and the insults, because that's in a different you know, category. Uh, but a lot of the language that is still used today uh, about women in the public arena uh, has uh, the same impact. And I, I just hope that this, uh, I hope that this documentary, as people watch it, will spark conversations like the one we're having, so that it, it's not, it's not off limits to say, wait a minute, you know, why, why is this still part of the uh, ongoing dialogue about women's roles and women's rights? And of course, I think we're going through a real backlash, so I think the conversation is even more important. I don't want to quote Bart Simpson in such a serious conversation, <laughs> but I'm going to. Please do, please do. Bart Simpson says, and he didn't make this up, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And there's a moment in the fourth episode where you're in a debate and Donald Trump is stalking you. He's physically behind you. And in the documentary you say in real time that you're aware that he's standing behind you. Yep. And as you're speaking about some very important issue, you're playing out all these scenarios. What would happen if I turn around? I can't because this is how it will play. But what if I ignore him? This is how it will play. And that seems to be a constant theme throughout the documentary that if you go one direction, people will criticize you. For doing that, and another group of people criticize you for not doing it, that you're stuck at so many points in your life that any decision is going to have a polarizing effect. Yeah, because you know that word polarizing, I, I think about it a lot um, because clearly it's often the way that I'm described. And some of the people that uh, uh, Nanette tried to get to be interviewed for this film are certainly a lot more polarizing than, uh, than I think I am. But is Newt Gingrich described as polarizing? He may be described as a lot of things, but he's hardly ever described as polarizing. <laughs> and, you know, I look at these uh, political leaders um, predominantly on the Republican uh, side, and I think, 
well, what is so polarizing about me that it's a word that is used in practically every interview description that you can imagine? And I, you know, look, I will take, you know, whatever, uh, you know, responsibility for the role of, you know, being a human being and having opinions and expressing them and living my life and making the choices that I think are right for me, but it's not just that. And so part of the challenge I think this documentary poses to people is to say, well, wait a minute, you know, when I was taking that law school admission test that we talk about, um, I was with a group of young women that I went to college with, and we were in this huge lecture hall at Harvard, because that's where the test was going to be given. So we're sitting there waiting for the test to start, and the comments that were directed at us were not exclusive to me. It was, you know, what are you doing here? Why are you taking this test? If you go to law school, you'll take a place, and I won't get a deferment, and I'll go to Vietnam, and I'll be killed, and it'll be your fault. This is before we take the test, right? <laughs> and so, you know, at that point in my life, I didn't respond, because I wanted to do well on the test. So put your head down, do the work. That's what all the young women at this one table where we were all sitting together, all did. Today, I'd say, get a life. Get over it. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Now, that would make me polarizing, right? So, so I, I think that there's so much that we're still working out. And the incident that John just referred to in that second debate, you know, I knew exactly what he was doing. You know, it was alpha male writ large. You want to know what a president looks like? This is what a president looks like. Not this woman. Not this girl. That's not a president. And I'm going to show you how dominant I am. And you know what? That's going to trigger you know, some area in the base stem of your brain. And you're going to say, yeah, that's what a president looks like. This is really deep stuff. And so I'm up there, and I'm going, OK. I know exactly what he's doing. What do I do? Do I turn around and say, back off, you creep. I'm not intimidated by you, which I knew would have polarizing effects. Um, <laughs> and it would also raise the issue, like, you know, if she can't handle him, how is she going to handle Vladimir Putin? Well, I would add, a heck of a lot better than the current guy. Um, <laughs> so. You know, because I was the first and people, you know, as I say, I have, you know, I've been in the public eye for a long time, but even before I practiced law, I tried lawsuits and all that. I have worked with and against countless men who come in all sizes and shapes, all sorts of hairstyles, whose voices are deep or not so, and they're judged on who they are. But when a woman walks into that arena, she's like a prototype or representative for all women, and everybody unloads on her every single feeling or reaction that they have about women in the public eye. So what I did, as you, if those of you saw it, was do nothing, you know, just like I did back when I took the law school test. Just do the job. And hopefully people will say, hey, you know, I'd rather have somebody who is not acting like that, uh, dealing with the serious problems we have in the world. Nanette, Bill and Hillary's marriage is a central part of the story, especially in the la latter half of the documentary series. Why did you think it was important? And I want to ask you about interviewing Bill Clinton and asking him about his marriage and what those interviews were like. Well, I thought it was important for several reasons. I mean, one, they uh, have been partners in many ways beyond, you know, life partners, political partners for 50, year, 50 plus years. So, um, you know, choices that, that Hillary made in her life of moving to Arkansas, choices she made to change her name. I mean, all of these things of being, you know, choices that she made to be you know two for when she when Bill Clinton was running for president in '92, 
she, with you know, his not only blessing but encouragement, was was they were running as two for the price of one. You get two great brains for one, and and there was you know, of course, a backlash to that. But um, you know, the, so the and it was so part of it was a love story. The other thing, you know, we do spend at least a half hour of the series on the uh, impeachment, the Monica Lewinsky incident, and we really, I tried to deal with it very much from a, a personal perspective um, and how it affected them, how they handled the impeachment trial, how that affected their marriage, and th that was largely due to the fact that, and not because there's this salacious interest, but because so much of Secretary Clinton's life following that was judged in her uh, perception, particularly if she was running for office, when she was running for Senate, when she was running in 08, and very much when she was running 16. I can't tell you the number of educated, liberal female friends of mine who would say to me, oh, I can't vote for her. She didn't leave her husband. And I was like, what are you talking about? What is that? <laughs> you know? And so I thought it was really important to address the hypocrisy of this issue because, as is said in the series, a lot of people would say, oh, I would vote for Bill Clinton all over again, but not her. And so it was, it's a very complicated thing and it's very personal for people to, to unpack that because this played out in the public sphere. We wanted to... Uh, humanize it and understand it and understand how she's been judged in various ways ever since. Hillary, what is it like watching that footage of your husband offering up his explanation, rationalization for what he did with Monica Lewinsky and about how I think it's fair to say that you are paying the price for his sins? Well, that's pretty dramatic. Um, uh, well, I don't, you know, you couldn't have done a documentary about my life and not done a documentary about uh, my marriage. And uh, like every marriage I know, we've had ups and downs, uh, but ours have all played out in public after 1992 or so. And I think, um, you know, it was, it was difficult, uh, you know, talking about it, answering questions, you know, that, that is, you know, not my favorite way to spend the afternoon. Uh, but I was uh, very, um, you know, I was very committed to being as forthcoming as I could be in uh, working with Nanette, and uh, Bill was too. And I was, I was really um, grateful and proud of, you know, the, you know, the way that he answered questions and how he uh, talked about uh, that, you know, part of our our life together. But as Nanette said, I mean, it's you know, it's so much bigger than one, you know, one episode or, or one uh, event, and I think that also uh, comes out. Um, so I, I think, John, it, it would have been impossible to do this documentary if I said I wouldn't talk about that or Bill had said he wouldn't talk about that. And, you know, people have to watch it and make their own uh, judgments about it. Uh, there's certainly uh, an interesting uh, discussion about it in the film because, as Nanette just said, um, look, I, I was well aware that, you know, it was very difficult for uh, a lot of people, particularly a lot of women, and some of the women friends and supporters, uh, colleagues that I have, were interviewed in the movie, and they would go uh, to meetings with groups of women, and women would say what Nanette said, oh, you know, I can never vote for her because of that. And then they'd have a conversation, and all of a sudden, you know, some woman would say, well, you know, that happened to me, or another woman would say, it happened to my best friend, or it happened to my sister. Um, and so all of a sudden, rather than saying, you know, I, I, I can't vote for her because of that, people had to say, you know, life is complicated, and people make, difficult choices every single day when it comes to relationships, including marriage. Uh, and then, you know, very memorably, um, Mandy uh, Grunwald in the, in the, the movie, who uh, worked in the 92 campaign, obviously, you know, worked in my campaigns, you know, she basically says, you know, it was always so frustrating because these very same women would say they'd vote for my husband again. So think about that. Right. You know, I would vote for him again, too. But I think, 
you know, I, I think that, I, I think that the, again, this is like brainstem stuff we're talking about. Um, so you should have made a different choice, but boy, do I like him. And of course, his approval ratings always showed that. And that should have, because I don't think any person should be judged by the worst day of their life or the worst decision that they made. And particularly when there's a record to look at. Um, so I, I think that this had to be part of the uh, film. I saw you at Brian Fogel's new movie, The Dissident, about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And a large part of that movie is about social media and about how Saudi Arabia controls the country by controlling social media. And it feels like one of the takeaways from this documentary is the ways that social media can be used and misused in an era where facts and lies are almost interchangeable. So when you think about some of the takeaways from the documentary and with this other movie fresh in your mind, how do you see a path through that where we're living in what I think we can call a post-factual world where you can post Twitter, or you can create Twitter accounts that don't represent anybody or may actually be you know, created by foreign governments? I think this is one of the most important uh, questions that we all have to try to both face and answer. <clears throat> and if you haven't seen The Dissident, I hope you will, and they do a chillingly effective job of demonstrating the swarm that social media can be because they use animation to show uh, how the Saudi government with their now very large group of uh, uh, information warriors uh, are influencing uh, and using disinformation and personal attacks on uh, social media against dissidents and activists and, and others. Add to that the information that we just learned about the, uh, the hacking, the placing of malware on Jeff Bezos's phone. Uh, ironically, uh, technology created in Israel, um, sold to the Saudi government. And you know that's just one example of what we're all up against. And I think that we are facing in this, um, in this time uh, such a challenge to uh, our values, our privacy, our freedom, you know, all of that was, that was displayed in the movie, The Dissident, but it's happening in real time back here at home. And I'm, as I've said um, over and over, I'm very disappointed that Facebook is enabling this, uh, that they are welcoming false advertising, which enormously advantages uh, not only Trump, but people like him, uh, people making cases like he's making to you know, inflame feelings and create uh, dissidents and conspiracy theories and all the rest. So I don't have any, I don't have any answers, but I, I feel like we are um, a wash in disinformation. And right now, I look at the 2020 election and I see so much of what happened in 2016 being repeated, but it's more sophisticated than it was in 2016. I think, you know, voter suppression, of course, is going on, but, you know, the hacking and the weaponization of information, uh, the, the false information, the propaganda, the deep fakes, which will come into their own uh, in this election season, uh, the not just permission, but the profiting from uh, false advertising. Uh, it, it is incredibly dangerous. And this, this movie, The Dissident, which focuses on a young man who was speaking out against uh, the Saudis and in a communication with Khashoggi, uh, whose phone was, uh, uh, invaded by uh, Pegasus, this incredibly uh, effective uh, worm or uh, other form of warfare uh, that the Saudis used, he in the film toward the end says, you know, I may have, uh, I may have contributed to him being killed because they took everything out of my phone. And by taking everything out of my phone, they saw my emails, my text messages, all of my exchanges with Khashoggi. That may have contributed to this horrific decision uh, that led to his being dismembered inside the Saudi consulate. So 
This is serious stuff, and we obviously don't have a government right now that cares about it. In fact, they think it advantages them. Uh, and the tech companies seem unwilling to shoulder the full responsibility, in particular Facebook. So I'm really worried about where all this leads. There are two impeachment trials in the series. One is when you go to Washington to work on the impeachment of Richard Nixon, obviously the impeachment of Bill Clinton. There's another impeachment trial going on right now that didn't make your deadline, Annette. If <laughs> the epilogue. It's uh, the sequel, Hillary 2.0. But if you were being interviewed now for this documentary about what's happening in Washington, what would your thoughts be? Well, you really can't make my life up, which is why what Nanette has done is so remarkable, um, trying to capture it as she has in four hours. Um, yeah, I did. I worked on the impeachment uh, inquiry staff of the House Judiciary Committee in 1974. And among my uh, tasks as a very young new lawyer uh, was studying what the framers meant by impeachment in the Constitution, particularly what does high crimes and misdemeanor mean, and why it was included. Because think about it, the framers knew that if all went well, we would have elections, and so a president or some other high official could be removed for uh, inappropriate uh, behavior, uh, actions taken that were undermining of the Republic uh, against the Constitution at the next election. But no, they didn't say that. They put this remedy in because knowing what they knew about human nature and what they had just escaped from, which was a monarchy with an absolute ruler, they worried that at some point in the future there might very well be a person, a president, um, who needed to be removed for the sake of our uh, nation, our sovereignty, our security uh, going forward. So I wrote, along with you know, a couple of other uh, lawyers, a document, which is still you know, in the government printing office, I guess, uh, talking about this and how impeachment was reserved for the kind of serious, egregious behavior that posed a risk to the security, the stability, the sovereignty of the nation. Okay. So in the Nixon impeachment, one of my other jobs was listening to the tapes and transcribing them, or more clearly, comparing the transcriptions the White House gave us with what was actually on the tape, which is very similar to what we are experiencing with this impeachment. And you listen to this, and you could literally listen to Richard Nixon taping himself excusing his behavior captured on tapes. So we called it the tape of tapes. And it was obvious that he was obstructing justice, he was abusing power, he was defying the Congress. And in those days, when the articles of impeachment were presented to the House Judiciary Committee, and Barbara Jordan made that remarkable speech talking about the Constitution, which please go to YouTube and, and look at it. Um, Republicans voted for the articles of impeachment. And once the House Judiciary Committee voted that, Republican leaders in the Senate went to see Nixon in the White House and said, you will be impeached, you should resign. Because there is proof of abuse of power, obstruction of justice, contempt of Congress. And Nixon did. So, you know, fast forward to where we are now. I don't think it could be any clearer that what the founders feared is at the core of the articles of impeachment against Trump. And it's, it's, it's fascinating the parallels between Trump and Nixon. So Nixon's people physically broke into the Watergate, right? And stole information about the Democrats that they thought would help them in the election. Trump's people, with the aid of the Russians, have not only broken in in a cyber way to steal information, but the Russians are still doing it. 
You know, the Russians hacked into the gas company, Burisma. And based on my experience of their hacking into the DNC, hacking into my campaign, you know, they are looking for anything that they can distort and weaponize. And knowing, as Trump said back in 16, if you find these things, the press will richly reward you. So the parallels of the abuse of power and the obstruction of justice between Nixon and uh, Trump are right in the meaning of what impeachment uh, should be used for. And, you know, look, you don't have Republicans like there were in 1974 uh, to say, this is, you know, this has to end and you have to go. That's not going to happen. Then that there are so many artists that I've talked to, not only at the film festival, but musicians, playwrights over the last couple of years who say that their priorities as an artist and a storyteller were changed by the 2016 election. I'm wondering, not just for yourself, but more broadly speaking, for filmmakers and documentary filmmakers, do you think there's a sense that people are changing the kinds of stories they want to tell? Do they feel a new urgency or are they feeling compelled to do stories that maybe they might not have considered a couple of years ago? Well, I think artists are always reflecting on what's happening at the time, and for many artists who, not all of them, but many tend to be more on the democratic or liberal side, I think they're scared and appalled at what is happening in our government, what is happening in our culture. I think we made, and are continuing in some ways culturally to make tremendous gains um, as far as equal rights, uh, and that is creating a horrendous, scary backlash for people. And so I think, as artists, you know, we we want to comment on it because we've become this insanely divided country, and both sides are so convinced of the opposite information. And it's and. And on the one side, you have people feeling like, okay, everyone should be equal, and, and you have, you know, the Me Too movement and marches, and and you know, uh, historically you have gay marriage, and 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 things are so e seemingly equalized. And then the other side, there's this tremendous fear of that, and so it everything gets pushed back. And so I think, you know, because we're so divisive, that's what artists want to comment on. And the Trump election was very symptomatic of what was already brewing and come to fruition. Last question is for Hillary. I'd like the audience to stay in your seats when we're done so Hillary and Nanette can leave. Hillary, the end of this documentary, and I'll share a personal story, left my wife and I in a spirited debate. I found it somewhat pessimistic. She found it optimistic. Um, <laughs> We can get into the details later, but <laughs> in terms of what you think are the takeaways from where we go from where this story ends to where we are now and maybe five years from now or maybe a year from now in the next election, um, what do you hope people take away from it and how would you assess that optimistic, pessimistic take that my wife and I had? That's fascinating, John. Um, um, I don't want to polarize your... Uh, Maybe family. Um, it's already polarized. Oh well, uh, life is complicated. Um, I remain fundamentally optimistic um, because I really can't believe that we're going to uh, destroy the greatest experiment in uh, self-government uh, that the world has ever seen. I just can't believe that. And so I don't believe it, and therefore I wake up every day thinking about what more do we need to do to protect what has worked and to fix what has not so that we do become fairer and juster and kinder and smarter and stronger um, as a country and uh, contribute uh, to the betterment of the world. I mean, you know, uh, that's what I think about. And so for me, um, I think there are several takeaways. One, I do hope that there is a debate about not just me and what you know I uh, you know have experienced, but how that affects and reflects other people's experience, so that it's a, a more general conversation about women's roles and women's lives and the progress we have been uh, making, but you know some of the remaining uh, challenges that we face. 
I also hope it sparks a conversation about our politics. Um, how did we get to the point where uh, we literally cannot make the decisions that will uh, protect uh, our planet, um, create more economic opportunity, um, provide you know, universal health care? I mean, there, there's a scene in the movie that literally I had forgotten wherever she dug it up. Um, when I was fighting for universal health care coverage, uh, people were burning me in effigy. Now, why was it so threatening that I thought everybody should have quality, affordable health care? However we get there, let's have a good debate about that. But the idea that that would cause me to be burned in effigy? Think about it. So, yeah, I was polarizing about health care. It's still polarizing, isn't it? And I don't mind having been out there on it because we need to resolve this. It's outrageous, shameful that we haven't. So I, th I want people to think about our politics. Now, I have a view about why it's broken. And my view is not to excuse Democrats or the left or any of that. But my view is it's a result of a concerted, determined, well-funded effort that goes back decades. And an alliance between really strong financial interests, um, often motivated not just by greed and profit, but by a rejection of government and regulation, um, centered in the oil and gas industry, but not exclusively that, that made an alliance with ideological and religious leaders and groups to try to push back cultural change. I think that we have been uh, watching this build, and, and Trump is the, you know, is the willing vehicle for it. Uh, and you see it in everything he does, which is to fire up his base, which you know is very much uh, influenced by right-wing radio and Fox News and everything else that goes with it. So if you've been, as I have been, not just you know, in the eye of the storm you know, for all these years, but calling it out, because you know, I've seen it, it's been directed at me, um, I think we have a huge existential decision to make this November. And I've said, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again, whoever the Democratic nominee is, get behind that person. Just like I did with Barack Obama. And, you know, my, my election in 2008 was much closer than the election in 2016. I actually got more votes, but fewer delegates. And as soon as that was clear, within days, I dropped out, I endorsed him, I appeared with him, I did 100 events for him, I went to the floor of the convention in Denver because my delegates still wanted to vote for me. They'd worked hard for me, they believed in me, and they wanted to vote for me. So I went to the floor of the convention and I moved to nominate Barack by acclamation. Think of the difference in 2016 where I won by four million votes. I'd won by the end of March. And until literally days before the election, there were people saying, no, 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 we can't do that. Can't vote for her. All I'm saying is we cannot afford that. And so the stakes, which are reflected of the politics we currently have and what could happen to this country and the world if we don't retire the incumbent, should be very clear in this film. And so for anybody who watches it, please, you've got to be committed to doing everything you can, literally, to save the republic from the right, the Republicans, and Trump.